We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us for this edition of BFI's Becker Brown Bag Series featuring Chad Cyberson. My name is Sam Ori, and I'm the Executive Director of BFI. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, BFI is a collaborative platform for the diverse University of Chicago <coughs> economics community with nearly 300 PhD economists on campus uh, and even more scholars engaged in research related to the economy. Uh, having an institute that brings our scholars together around issues of common interest uh, and to coordinate allows us to leverage this work in a way that we think can have real impact. Uh, with that, uh, oh, I should mention, to learn more, uh, check us out at bfi.uchicago.edu. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Chad Cyberson. Chad is the Eli B. and Harriet B. Williams Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago uh, in the Booth School of Business. His research spans several topics with a particular focus on interactions of the firm, market structure, and productivity. I'm also delighted to share that Chad has uh, just uh, accepted that he'll co-chair BFI's new industrial organization research initiative, uh, so we're very excited for all the work that will be coming out of that. Chad's work has been published in several top journals, uh, and he's earned multiple National Science Foundation awards. He serves as an editor of the Journal of Political Economy, is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economics Research, and has recently served on National Academies Committees and is the chair of the Chicago Census Research Data Center uh, Board here at the university, or actually I should say down at the uh, Chicago Fed, hopefully soon at the university. <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Chad. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming today. It's good to, uh, to have you here to visit about some work I'm doing with uh, Eric Bernielsen and Daniel Rock, who are both at MIT. Uh, and uh, what we're looking at is how artificial intelligence technologies fit into what we've called the modern par uh, productivity paradox. And I'll explain what that is in in just a second. OK, so there's two elements to the paradox. One is, on one side, you've got a lot of technological optimism out there. Here are some quotes from folks you've probably uh, heard of or read in the business press talking about uh, this great new world we have entered where we can do things that uh, we couldn't do before and uh, sort of the sky's the limit over the coming years in terms of, of where we're going to go with these new technologies. And this isn't pure uh, puffery. There are real hard metrics of performance uh, that this optimism is grounded in. So for example, machine learning algorithms have recently become, um, uh, have seen their error rates decline to below 5%, which is about roughly the level of an untrained human. So once you get an algorithm better than a person, you can, of course, start swapping out the uh, algorithm for the, the person. Uh, so I don't know if you can tell which of those pictures on the left is a blueberry muffin and which is the face of a chihuahua, but it turns out a machine learning algorithm can do a better job than you can. Okay. Um, there's another example of, of how uh, machine learning algorithms work. You, you train up the algorithm and then you give it a brand new picture and it figures out as best it can what it is. There's actual examples from a commonly used algorithm and uh, it, you know, it doesn't just give you a guess, yes or no, it gives you probabilistic guesses and you can see how well it does there on some of those examples on the left. Uh, that's image recognition and other closely related technologies and voice recognition. That also is starting to beat human abilities in a lot of applications. So again, the same sort of um, potential exists there. And uh, very recently, it turns out there's been considerable progress in protein folding prediction, which I have recently discovered is a thing. So. Uh, a little background on this. Every two years uh, at the CASP, I don't know if they call it a CASP or, or what, but that's a big meeting every two years where folks who try to predict protein folding, which is really important for lots of biochemical processes, um, come together and sort of 
lay out best practice and how what kind of progress they've made. These are, this is the progress over the last four meetings. And you can see on the right there is the most recent meeting, which was held just last year. And the top performer, you can see, is the blue line pulling away from the second place performer. The dash line is what you would predict the top performer would have done based on the progress of the top performers in the three prior uh, meetings. So you can see there's a considerable uh, increment to the progress that's been made in predicting protein folding. Now the interesting story is the top team at the most recent meeting was from DeepMind. So you, and there were about 10 people, albeit 10 people with a lot of money behind them, 10 people, none of whom worked in this field, came in and did better than hundreds of people working in the field around the world did over the same period using machine lear learning algorithms. Um, so again, this is just another example of sort of the unique and uniquely fast progress that's been made in terms of applying uh, machine learning and AI techniques uh, in the field. Okay, so that's, that's the one side of the paradox, which is this technological optimism. The other side is the fact that actual productivity growth as measured in the economy is terrible. Okay, so to give you some numbers, we are more than a decade into a productivity growth slowdown in the US, but not just in the US, basically around the world. Every, uh, almost every OECD country, that's basically the, the wealthiest, most developed economies of the world, plus uh, with a few years lag, uh, also the larger emerging, most of the larger emerging economies of the world too have seen uh, declines in labor productivity growth. So in the U.S., the magnitude of that slowdown is uh, shown up here. From 1995 to 2004, labor productivity growth was 2.9% per year. That means a, a given worker hour produced just under 3% more output than it did the year prior. Okay, so you're getting 3% more stuff with the same amount of labor inputs. That has slowed by more than half since the mid-2000s. Uh, 2005 to 17 is 1.3 percent per year. We were supposed to have the 2018 data. That's delayed a month because of the government shutdown, but it's not going to go up much. Uh, if you look at the first three quarters, uh, we're maybe you could bump that up to 1.4 percent per year, but probably not. So we're still in a, in a slowdown. Okay. Um, and again, this is going on all, all over the place. Uh, here's some just highly smooth data from the uh, conference board's uh, total economy database showing labor productivity growth rates going back almost 50 years now. You can see the world total uh, has peaked right about the mid-2000s, right when the slowdown started in the US, and it's been declining since then. OK, so how much does this, does this mean? Well. Labor productivity growth is basically the speed limit on GDP per capita growth. You can't get long run economic growth without labor productivity growth. It's just that simple. Okay? And it's, it's about one for one. So if long run labor productivity growth falls by a percent and a half per year, you can sort of figure that if that's sustained, GDP per capita growth is going to fall by about one and a half percent per year. Now for one year or two year, that's not the end of the world, but you compound that over multiple years, over a decade or two decades, it gets pretty big. So for example, had the labor productivity growth slowdown not happened in the US, had we kept, after 2004, kept growing at that 3% per year rate, conservatively, GDP this year would be $4 trillion higher than it is. $4 trillion per year, so that's $12,000 per capita per year that we are, quote, missing because of the labor productivity slowdown. If the slowdown continues another decade, uh, we'll be, quote, missing almost half of, half of the potential output that we would have expected in the beginning of the 2000s. Okay, so this stuff adds up, and it's important. And the issue is, how do you have simultaneously these fantastic new technologies that are doing things that 
uh, no one's been able to do before, yet we still see really lousy productivity growth in practice. That's what we consider in these papers. And we come up with four basic explanations. Okay, here they are. One we call false hopes, which is just the optimism about the technology, those specific examples aside, is just misplaced. And we shouldn't expect labor productivity growth to speed up again based on new uh, machine learning and AI techniques. The second story is mismeasurement, which is the opposite, which these technologies are here, they're fantastic, and they are producing gains. The problem is our ability to measure those gains has waned since the early 2000s. And so the slowdown is just a figment of our mismeasurement, not an actual decline in the rate of technological progress. The third story is what we call the distribution and dissipation story. And there's a couple elements to that. One element is that the gains are real of these technologies, but they have fallen primarily on only a few players. Okay? And you could probably name those companies if you wanted to tell this story. Okay? Moreover, those companies, because of the nature of the technologies, have to expend a lot of resources protecting them from being taken and applied by their rivals. And those rivals, in turn, spend a lot of resources trying to take those uh, uh, technologies away from the leaders. And that process of protection and, and attempted appropriation ends up burning up most of the gains that we see, would see otherwise, from the technology. That's the distribution dissipation story. And then the fourth story is the implementation and lag story, which is the technology is here, it's real, its potential is real, but it takes time, effort, and complementary products and capital to actually gain the benefits of those technologies. And so there's going to be a gap period where the technology is around, you can sense its potential, but you don't actually yet see those gains in the data. We consider each of these in turn, and while we think little bits of each probably exist in the data, we think the first three probably are not the primary explanation for what's going on. Okay, so if we think about false hopes, it's certainly true you can come up with examples of past technologies that people have been excited about that didn't pan out. For example, fusion energy has been 20 years away for 60 years. Okay? Uh, and in fact, the first uh, generation of AI in the 1980s ended up being disappointed, disappointing after initial excitement about its potential. So we are certainly circumspect about that. On the other hand, it's not hard to come up with what we think are pretty reasonable scenarios where you can close that 1.5% per year productivity gap with only a modest number of applications of these new technologies. And again, in what we think are realistic scenarios. And I'll walk you through a couple of those in a few minutes. Okay, so we're not, we're not quite so um, ready to dismiss the potential of these technologies. The mismeasurement story is something I've actually worked on a lot. I have a whole separate uh, study on it. Um, basically, the, while on its face plausible, uh, you know, we get these new technologies and they're free, we don't have to pay for them, so they're not captured in GDP, yet we spend so much time using them and get a lot of utility out of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That story, while plausible, implies a bunch of stuff that's measurable and none of that stuff is true. Okay, you see none of the telltale signs of mismeasurement going on. Um, moreover, if you're going to tell a mismeasurement story, it's not just, well, we don't measure output very well. It is, we started mismeasuring output worse in 2004 and in a particular direction and around the world. And it's hard to imagine that all of that happened. Okay, besides all the direct evidence that I talk about in my other work. So again, while no one's saying measurement is perfect, we just don't think that's what's explaining the $4 trillion of 
lost output in the US. The distribution and dissipation story is consistent with some things you've seen. Definitely there's sort of been an increasing sort of leaders running away from the pack dynamic in a lot of industries. And you might say, well, those are the few beneficiaries from these technologies. The problem is you have to explain how this $4 trillion of missing output somehow is being gained and expended, but we're just not capturing it in anything we measure. So it's a little bit like the measurement story that way. And if you told me there were $40 billion of stuff we're missing in terms of rent dissipation, I might believe that. $4 trillion is a whole lot of stuff to just not even know is, is going on out there. I don't, I don't think that that's very quantitatively plausible. So that leaves us with the implementation and restructuring leg story, that the technology is real, but we haven't seen its actual productivity effects yet because for various reasons that I'll talk about, it takes time for those benefits to actually accrue and show up in the aggregate statistics. Okay? If this story is right, then the paradox of forward-looking technological optimism and present and past looking lousy productivity performance might be a paradox, but it's not a contradiction. Moreover, it's actually two sides of the same story. That you would expect there to be a period of relatively slow productivity growth before an increase and in an acceleration in productivity from the new technology, because there's this period of retrenchment where you are figuring out how to take advantage of the new technology, installing it in business processes, and then in inventing the complementary processes, organizational structures, and capital that go along with the new technology. And all of those processes take time, and so you don't immediately see the benefits of the technology, even though you can sense its potential. Okay, so this is what we end up being uh, thinking is the most likely story for what's going on, the paradox. I want to be clear, it's not just, well, there are four stories and we don't think it's the first three, so it must be this one. That's not solely what we're basing this on. We also have an affirmative case for the implementation lag story, and I'm going to give you that uh, today. Okay, so what are those, what is that case? There are three elements. First, I'm going to show you just as a statistical matter, that past productivity growth doesn't predict future productivity growth. So the mere fact that we've had slow productivity growth for a while tells us nothing in a statistical sense about what we should expect productivity growth going forward to be. Okay, so the fact things are bad now does not imply we should expect them to stay bad, just as a statistical matter. The second element are those back of the envelope uh, examples of achievable productivity growth that I talked about. I'll give you a couple simple examples where we think you can get considerable increases in labor productivity growth from the application of these technologies, okay, even in what are speaking in terms of the economy are relatively narrow applications. And then third, we're going to make we make the case that Artificial intelligence might be the next general purpose technology. I'll just define what a general purpose technology is, but as you can tell from the term, uh, they can have big effects. And I'll, I'll show you uh, what that means and what that's meant in the past in terms of productivity growth and general purpose technology. Okay, so first the statistical matter. So what we did is we took data over a 60 year period and computed year by year, we went backwards 10 years and said, all right, in the prior 10 years to this year, what has been the average labor productivity growth rate? And then we compared that to the labor productivity growth rate of the 10 years that followed. Okay, and so then we just rolled that forward over 50 years. Okay, so that's what's plotted in this figure. The past 10 years productivity growth is plotted on the horizontal axis, the subsequent 10 years productivity growth is plotted on the vertical axis, and as you can see, there's essentially no relationship between the 10 years prior growth and the 10 years future growth. There's a very slight upward uh, 
uh, uh, upward relationship, but it's, it's actually tiny. If you take the entire span of productivity growth rates in the data, you imply a differential of around less than two-tenths of a percent per year in product, predicted future productivity growth, and it's statistically insignificant. Okay, so basically, again, the lesson is if productivity growth has been slow recently, it doesn't imply at all that it's going to be slow going forward. It doesn't, it's not negatively so, slow, so it's not going to imply it, we must speed up in any sense. It just tells you nothing. Right? You can see this measure a number of different ways. The, this is labor productivity growth. If you want to look at total factor productivity growth, so that adjusts for capital intensity. Also, you find basically no relationship, a very small upward slope, but that predicts basically no significant change in productivity growth. There's the regression numbers, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. That's just the, regret, the actual uh, regression numbers from those plots I showed you already. OK, so that's the statistical element of the case. The second element of the case are those examples of <laughs> productivity growth we think could come from the applications of these technologies. Okay? So one you hear about a lot, I'm sure, is autonomous vehicles. Okay? Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports 3.5 million Americans work as some form of motor vehicle operator. Okay? We think uh, it's plausible that autonomous vehicles could reduce this number to 1.5 million. In other words, replace roughly 2 million professional drivers of various types. Okay? Um, private employment is about 122 million people. So if you're getting the same output, so the, the algorithms will replace the drivers, you're going to move the same amount of freight around, et cetera, so you'll get the same output with 2 million fewer workers off of a base of 122 million. That implies a labor productivity increment of 1.7%. Now, this process of replacing drivers doesn't happen overnight, so you don't get those, that labor productivity growth immediately. If it occurs over a period of, say, a decade, which we think is not implausible, that would imply an increment to labor productivity growth over that decade of 0.17, roughly, percent per year. Okay, so that's one, from one technology affecting you know, less than 2% of the labor force, we would get an increment of 0.17% per year over the course of a decade. Another example of something Eric has worked a lot on in his work are call centers. There are roughly 2.2 2 million, 2 .2 million people who work in a call center of one sort or the other based on conversations with people in the industry we think it's plausible that 60% of these folks could have what they do done by a machine learning AI algorithm instead. Again, that off of the base of 122 million uh, workers, that implies a 1% increase in labor productivity. Again, that's not going to happen overnight. If it takes a decade for this switch out to occur, that's going to increment labor productivity by 0.1% per year for uh, a decade. So just with these two technologies that are affecting in total, you know, three to four percent of the workforce, you've already got an implied increment to labor productivity growth of over a quarter percent. If you come up with five, six, seven more examples like this, and we think you can, you've basically explained the product, uh, productivity slowdown away, or reversed it is maybe a better way to say it. Okay, so we think that quantitatively these, these new technologies have uh, potential that is, could realistically get us back on a 3% per year productivity growth rate, at least for a decade, uh, if not longer. Okay. Uh, these examples are labor productivity growth. You can also see increases in capital productivity coming from um, machine learning and AI applications. So uh, Google used DeepMind to start running, in an experiment, run their uh, data center um, HVAC, basically. And so here's the, uh, um, a plot of their energy use uh, before 
during and after this experiment where they let the uh, algorithm take over for the humans in terms of running the mechanics of the data centers. And you can see that energy use declined uh, during the length of the experiment. And then when they shut the algorithm off, it went back up to its initial level. Okay, so this isn't just about swapping out humans. It's also about making the capital that we already have more productive as well. I'll note that the calculations I just went through uh, are simple. Here's a job. We're just going to have a machine do it instead of a person, productivity growth rate uh, uh, differentials. However, as I'll get to in a second, one of the greatest potentials for general purpose technologies, like perhaps AI, is that they spur the creation of uh, complementary types of capital. And those technologies also increase labor productivity growth. So they can have big spillover effects besides just the direct replacement effects I already talked about. So you could imagine, for example, how different retail could look if we had little tiny autonomous vehicles taking everything you ordered to your house within an outer hour of when you order it. That's just going to reconfigure large swaths of the economy. None of that's in the calculation we talked about with our autonomous vehicles. But you might think that those will have their own productivity gains tied to them as well. All right, so the last element of the case for the implementation leg story is that AI might be the next general purpose technology. Okay. Economists Tim Bresnahan and Manuel Trattenberg wrote a, a book a couple decades ago about general purpose technologies. And they said there are three defining characteristics of a G GPT. It must be pervasive, in other words, used all over the place. It should be able to be improved upon over time. And it should create these complementary innovations that I was just talking about. And we think that AI does reasonably check the box in each of these cases. So in terms of pervasiveness, you know, when it boils right down to it, machine learning algorithms are a prediction machine. And prediction seems to have application across all sorts of economic contexts. And so the pervasiveness um, doesn't strike us as something difficult for AI and machine learning to achieve. In terms of its ability to be improved upon over time, well, it's got machine learning in it. By nature, it's supposed to be getting better as it's used. And in fact, if it works, as we might hope, this will be the first capital that actually makes itself better, rather than having people make the capital better. Uh, and then third, in terms of ability to spawn complementary innovations, I've mentioned a quick example already. But there's some things like, it's perception abilities of AI, cognition abilities built into AI. They're building blocks that work together in a complementary way. In other words, each one makes the other one more productive. And so we think also that the, the ability, and plus you add that to that its pervasiveness, you can imagine lots of complementary innovations being spun off as a result of applying these um, technologies to new to new scenarios. OK, so fine. Let's suppose you believe the case so far that AI is this great new thing that could be used everywhere, will get better and spawn all these complementary innovations. Where are those productivity gains? Well, that's from the implementation and restructuring legs bit. And there's two elements to that. First, you simply need to build up enough stock of this new capital for it to actually move the aggregate dial. And that can take a considerable amount of time. I'll give you an example in a second. And second, the real gains are often harnessed from the new technologies once these complements are put into place with them. But those complements very rarely exist already and are just pulled off the shelf and put into uh, service with the new technologies. Typically, they need to be invented and uh, uh, implemented themselves. And that process also takes time. And it can take a long bit of time, as I'll show you in a second. Third, 
There's also a measurement issue that I haven't mentioned yet um, that can happen when those complements are intangibles. When it's a kind of capital that we don't measure well, things like business organizational structures, um, uh, brand equity, know-how, you know, production know-how, stuff that doesn't go on a balance sheet as capital but acts as capital in production, um, then you can actually get a measurement phenomenon where even after the gains of the technology are accruing to the economy, you're going to understate that initially. I'll show you how that works in a couple minutes. Uh, and then later you'll overstate the contribution of the technology. We call this the J curve and I'll get to that in a second. So for all of these reasons, we might not expect these technologies as great as we might think they are, and even if we believe their potential is real, we might not expect them to show up now or even next year or in a couple years, depending. All right, so let me give you some examples of how long these legs can be with general purpose technologies. Okay, now we titled this talk, The Modern Productivity Paradox. There was a prior productivity paradox, the famous solo productivity paradox, uh, based on a joke he made in 1988 where he said, we see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics. He was basically talking about early IT the way we're talking about AI now. This stuff seems to be put into place, everyone's talking about how great it is, yet productivity growth at the time was not very good. Okay? Um, it turns out when he said that in the late 80s, computer stock had just that year finally hit its long run level of uh, 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 application in the US economy. So it hit 5% of the total equipment stock in the US in 1988. And that's about what it is today, all IT capital, about 5% of equipment capital. Okay? It took 25 years, 25 years after commercial availability of computers to get to that long run level. Okay, and only 10 years prior to his joke, it was half of that. So even after a technology is around and is commercially available, it can take, again, a quarter of a century to be installed up to the point where it's actually moving aggregates in the way you would expect it to move those aggregates in the long run. Okay, so the simple process of accumulating enough of this capital and putting it into place in production takes time, and that's the first element of the story. Another example, go back to an earlier still general purpose technology, and that was the electric motor, or I like to say portable power, because it's really the electric motor and the internal combustion engine together, which were commercialized around the same time. They were commercialized in the 1890s, okay? But if you went and looked at US manufacturers in 1919, again, about a quarter of a century later, only half were actually electrified. The other half were still running on coal or water power. Okay? Now we know electric motors are superior technology to power manufacturing relative to coal or water. How do we know that? Because no one runs on coal or water anymore. They all run on electricity. Okay? But even after, again, a quarter century of the commercial availability of this clearly superior technology, only half of manufacturers had actually installed it. Okay. In part, so that's going to slow down how long it takes to, for these new technologies to affect, um, affect aggregate productivity. Sam? Is, is this how you explain, that's something I've been wondering this whole time, is uh, robotics. Like, like things that have been installed over the last 25 years, they coincide with that period of reduced productivity growth. Like, I mean, auto manufacturing plants and all the resistance to IT. Yeah. So we actually did a calculation like that, and yes, pro average productivity, if you account for sort of intangibles that were put into place, intangible capital was put into place with that kind of, um, those production processes, yes, measured productivity growth would be higher. It doesn't explain the slowdown though, because it would have been higher both before 2004 and after 2004. 
So there is some missing productivity growth there. It's not responsible for the slowdown, but yeah, the, the idea is the same. Well, to be clear, some of it is showing up. We are getting 1.3% a year productivity growth, and it's actually faster, faster manufacturing because manufacturing has traditionally automated at a faster rate than other sectors. It's just that it's slower than it used to be. Yeah. Um, okay, so th these things, again, take a lot of time. Let me ask you to do one thought experiment with me that I've found useful in thinking about these things. And that is to compare those two general purpose te technologies I just talked about. The portable power of the electric motor and internal combustion engine and IT, early IT. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an analogy between those two technologies and the years 1890 and 1970. I'm going to say that roughly speaking, 1890 was to portable power, what 1970 was to IT. And that's kind of about right if you think about when those technologies were both invented initially and when they were commercialized. That's roughly, I think, an arguably uh, parallel situation. Okay, so what I've done here is I've plotted labor productivity, the level, in the US from 1890 to 1933, okay? And I've normalized it so its level in 1915 is equal to 100. So everything's relative to labor productivity in 1915. Okay, and you can see what happened is for this quarter century long period where portable power is commercially available but it's still being installed at a relatively modest rate in manufacturing, labor productivity growth is kind of slow. It's actually about 1.5% per year, it turns out, from 1890 to 1915. And then in 1915, there's a bit of an inflection point. Productivity growth accelerates or roughly doubles to about 3% per year. And it grows at that rate until 1925, at which time there's another inflection point, And it flattens out again for about the next decade. OK, so that's just history. Now I'm going to give you a little more recent history. Again, I'm going to ask you to think of 1970 as being the IT analog to 1890 for portable power. I'm going to plot labor productivity in the US from 1970 until today, and normalizing the level in 1995, which would be equivalent to 1915 in this chart, to 1995 to 100. So I'm just going to overlay the two histories on top of one another. 1890, 1933, to 1970 to today. Here we go. All right. I found that to be a striking parallel. You have about a quarter of a century, 1970 to 1995, of slow productivity growth. Towards the end of that period, that's when Solo said, I look around, I see computers everywhere, I'm down in the productivity statistics. Well, a few years after he said that, labor productivity did accelerate. 1995 to 2004, it was 3% per year. But as we've already talked about, after the mid-2000s, it slowed back down again. Now, that brings us to today, but we have the extra advantage that we can go back to the earlier period and see what happened after the mid-1930s to labor productivity. So I'll show you that now. It accelerated again to 3% per year through the uh, decade that followed. OK, so what does this mean? It doesn't mean, given that productivity growth accelerated in the mid-1930s, that tomorrow we start growing at a faster rate. It doesn't work like that. But what it does say is the productivity benefits of a technology do not have to arrive in one wave, give what it's got, and then go away and never be seen again. It can come in multiple waves. And if you think AI is sort of potentially the second wave of IT, that would be a nice parallel to what we saw earlier with portable power, where there were basically two accelerations of productivity growth with a quarter century of slow growth before and an intervening period of slow productivity growth as well. 
One more example of these long legs. This plot shows, well, just focus on the blue line. This shows the share of GAFO retail sales. GAFO, it's a, basically it's stuff you'd buy in a department store, kind of things like that. Doesn't include automobiles or gasoline, some stuff that goes into the broad-based retail numbers. It's more specific things you think of when you go to a store to buy, basically. Okay? This is the fraction of GAFO sales in the US that are made online, the blue line. Okay, and you can see by 1917, that was about 30%. We're at about a third now. Okay. Um, so we're at a third of those kind of sales being online sales. In the mid-1990s, of course, they were, that was small. It was really small. Uh, I, I'm old enough to remember the mid-1990s. When Amazon started, people completely recognized that it could really transform what retail looked like. Okay? But it didn't actually transform what retail looked like, arguably until maybe a couple years ago. I actually have another paper on this with Ali Hotatsu that showed the changes that happened in retail between 1995 and 2015 were not really about e-commerce. It was about the rise of the super center and the warehouse club. Okay? Maybe in the last couple years, with some big bankruptcies and otherwise, you can say, okay, now Amazon et al. are starting to have an effect on the retail landscape. But that's 20 years after people recognized they might, in fact, some people thought they very well will have an effect on the retail landscape. It takes a long time for those changes to happen. And it's not just about all the production side things that have to happen, the reconfiguration of supply chains, et cetera. Customers had to be retrained to think about how they do retail too. You had to be comfortable giving your credit card number to someone on the other end of a computer that you never saw. You had to get used to the idea that things would come to your house and be delivered and you'd wait a couple days to get something you wanted. And that you, if you didn't want it, you could put it back in the box and the company would take it back and give you your money back. All that sort of stuff people had to get comfortable with over time. And so all these things that need to happen, both on the demand side of the market and the supply side of the market, the reconfiguration of organizations within companies, et cetera, et cetera, all of that is the sort of thing that we think add to these implementation legs that create the gap between when you recognize the potential of a technology and when it actually starts showing up in our measures of market performance. Okay. So the one last bit I'll talk about is this measurement element, which is even after the technology is starting to be implemented, there can be a, a further lag in measurement between what's going on and what you see in the data. And the easiest way to think about it is to imagine that a lot of the capital, the complements that go along with AI, are actually intangible kinds of capital. They're not things that we see as capital put into the national accounts and say, ah, this is capital and it makes stuff. We're just going to be thinking it'll be measured as an expense in business instead. And if that's true, you might think, and this is how I thought about it initially, okay, if this stuff, this intangible capital makes output, but we're not counting it as an input, we should overstate productivity. We get some output out of this thing that we're not, you know, we get numerator without having to put anything in the denominator of productivity. But that's not exactly the right way to think about it because that intangible capital is actually an output itself. Okay? When you make capital, that's an output as well, just as when you make final consumption goods. Okay? So you're not just mismeasuring the denominator, you're mismeasuring the numerator too. And it turns out under plausible conditions, and there they are, I'll give you a quiz in a couple of minutes on this. I'll just tell you the story rather than all the equations. It basically, under a lot of plausible scenarios, it all boils down to what, what grows faster, the investment rate of intangibles or the actual stock of intangibles. And usually you'd think initially the investment rate is growing faster than the stock, and then later the two flip sides. Well, it turns out those relative growth rates are what determine whether productivity is undermeasured or overmeasured. And for a lot of reasons, we think, again, investment rates are going to be, or investment rate is going to be growing faster than the actual stock 
it will be growing early on. So you're going to undermeasure productivity early and overmeasure it later. Basically, what's going you're making all this capital now. Firms are restructuring themselves. They're trying to figure out how to build these algorithms into their production process, et cetera, et cetera. That's an actual intangible output, but we're not measuring it. So we're understating the denominator or the numerator. Later, we'll be getting output from that stuff, and we won't be counting all of that as capital in the denominator. We'll overstate productivity. Okay? That's, that seems to be what, what's going on. Here's a simulation. Now, it turns out the aggregate numbers aren't quite big enough to move the dial much. If you take you know, a good, I think, our best estimate of AI investments in the last, in 2018, is about $80 billion, plus or minus $80 billion. Um, if you, you, know, you apply some multiplier to that to get an implied amount of intangible capital investment, maybe we've got a misstatement of productivity of a few tenths of a percentage point. So it's not by any means explaining the slowdown or something like that. But going forward, as AI investments continue to increase, and they have been accelerating at a massive rate from a very low base, uh, we might expect this to be a bigger factor going forward. All right, so to wrap up, we think the implementation and restructuring lag story is the best way to explain this paradox between forward-looking technological optimism but the present fact on the ground that productivity growth is, is lousy. We don't have a lot to say about the particular time when these lags will sort of resolve themselves and we should start to see productivity accelerate again. It might be next year, but it might be five years from now. It could even be 10 years from now. Okay? But we've seen this before, as I've just shown you in history, with other general purpose technologies, if you believe that element of our case. In the past, those GPTs have taken a long time after their commercialization for them to, be, to show up in productivity, but they did show up. And that seems to be our best guess of what's going to be happening going forward in the future. All right, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you uh, coming, coming today.